Thank you so much, and welcome to our own Fête Galante this afternoon. It's a celebration of the delights of, of music and dance in the age of Watteau. This is intended to bring to life some of the sounds of the instruments and the movements of the dancers that are represented in so many of the paintings that you see in the exhibition upstairs. Uh, the thread of instrumental music that you'll hear through our short demonstration today um, is by François Couperin Le Grand, who was a near contemporary of Watteau. His Huitième Concert um, is part of a collection called Nouveau Concert ou les Goûts Réunis, that is, the reunited tastes bringing together the energy and vivacity of Italian theater and comedy with the uh, traditional French culture of douceur and uh, grace. Um, Couperin was very interested in, in creating a, a mix of both these cultures together. And his eighth concert of this collection is actually titled uh, Dans le goût théâtral, or In the Theatrical Taste. So it's a series of kind of portraits of theatrical moments of his culture. You've just heard a grand French overture followed by a, a lavish grand ritournel. We now turn to a uh, vocal number from one of Moliere's plays, which was extremely popular throughout the 18th century, Le Mariage Forcé. Uh, in one revival, this song was added by Marc-Antoine Charpentier. Uh, it's a song sung by uh, what uh, Georgia referred to as one of the wandering gypsies of the Fête Galante. Um, here, this wandering gypsy sings of the pleasures and perils of love.
As Georgia mentioned, the uh, fine and extraordinarily elaborate French musical language of the um, melodic language filled with ornaments and elaborate turns had its kind of visual component in the finely notated French court dance, which was uh, discovered for the first time. The 18th century actually developed its own dance notation for one of the very first times, so we can actually have a very good sense of what was going on um, from these dancers, from these extraordinary performers at the time. Uh, one of the most important choreographers of the time was Pécourt, who notated the following uh, musette. It's from an opera ball called Caliroé by André Cardinal de Touches, published around 1712. And uh, this is a musette which is very much in the style of, you'll hear the, the drones of a bagpipe. Um, as you'll see upstairs, the musette was a small, very elegant kind of bagpipe that would have been used to accompany fête galante um, and was also something that was imitated very often in orchestral music as well. It, uh, the simplicity and kind of rustic innocence of the tune is somewhat complicated in the dance, which has extraordinarily elaborate steps to this very simple and straightforward melody. Next, we have a small set of theatrical airs from this Couperin Concert, which feature our various melodic instruments, um, which you'll see actually in the exhibition itself. The one-keyed Baroque flute, a very simple wooden construction with just one key, and also the uh, very elegant Baroque oboe, also with only one key, is it true? Two keys. Um, I myself am have the great honor of playing the Met's own Stradivari that's been put back into Baroque conditions. So this has actually been restored to its uh, original setup. Accompanied um, on continuo, we have the viola de gamba, that is the uh, fretted cousin of the cello, uh, much closer actually to the guitar than to the modern cello, as well as a uh, wonderful reproduction of an 18th century French Baroque guitar. This is actually an instrument that you'll see a great deal in Watteau's paintings. And of course, no concert would be complete without the harpsichord.
In Moliere's great comedy, The Bourgeois Gentilhomme, which had a huge popularity throughout the late 17th and early 18th century, um, the play actually doesn't just end as we know it today. In fact, the very last line of the play is, well then, let's all go and watch the ballet. And in fact, what happens in the real productions is that a grand half hour of various ballet productions happens after that. One of the uh, entertainments that is part of this is a wonderful choreography of a dance for Harlequin, which has come down to us. So this is one of the few remaining surviving choreographies to demonstrate Harlequin's wit and uh, sassiness. So we now present Harlequin himself. Our next set of airs from the Couperin Suite include a quite wonderful and very magical saraband that's marked grave et tendre for the Baroque flute, and closes with a, a dance, a, rather a sung minuet, um, from Rameau's opera Dardanus. Jean-Philippe Rameau is better known to us today as a composer of wonderful, wonderful ballets and operas, but in fact, um, he had his start in Paris as a composer for the Théâtre de la Foire, the th fair theaters, or the, the street theaters. And it's quite possible that a great deal of the music which does not survive from his Théâtre de la Foire productions ends up in his operas, like perhaps this song about love.
the pleasures of love, we turn to the despairs of love. Lully's wonderful opera, Armide, uh, features a heroine who, in the great moment that she discovers her triumph over her mortal enemy, discovers, alas, that she has fallen in love with him as well. Uh, one of the wonderful features of this opera is a fantastic Passacaglia, uh, whose choreography again exists by Louis Pécourt. Um, and it's danced for us today by Carolyn Copeland in the traditional uh, opera costume wearing a mask, as Georgia mentioned, which has a remarkable effect, I think, of focusing the expressive energies on uh, the hands and the feet, which is really where the virtuosity of Baroque dance occurs.
next hear a passionate elegy by Jean-Baptiste Lully, taken from, of all things, a comedy, a very silly farce na called Georges Dandin, in which a peasant attempts to gain access to the higher realms of uh, upper middle class behavior with limited success. Um, in the middle of this very silly farce, suddenly there are these intermed involving various shepherds and shepherdesses, and one shepherdess comes out and sings a plant about the death of her lover, which is actually quite real and quite passionate. Um, I think this combination of uh, tragedy suddenly in the midst of comedy, of this, this mix of uh, melancholy and uh, farce at the same time, is very characteristic of, of Lily's music, and also very characteristic of Watteau's paintings in this. So we now present A Plainte en Musique by Jean-Baptiste Lully.
is there so ah, <laughs> behold, and it was given unto us. Our last set is actually taken from André Camprat's huge hit, Europe Galante, which uh, was first mounted in 1697. It uh, kind of set the stage for the entire world of this galanterie that Georgia has spoken of earlier, this kind of um, chic sophistication that dominated the early, early 18th century, especially in Paris. Camprat's uh, production of Europe Galante is a series of uh, scenes of various depictions of love in different countries. This is actually, he kind of invented the genre of opéra ballet with this, with this production. Um, so there's love among the Frenchmen, which is very noble and refined. Uh, there's love among the Italians, which is prone towards jealous rages. And there is love among the Spaniards, which is particularly fiery. Uh, today we present two dances from the Spanish entree, one a, a very spiky lure for a solo woman, and then a dance for a man and a woman, both from period choreographies. And in between, we'll hear one wonderful song from the Italian entree. This is actually uh, the first appearance of a da capo aria in France. It's actually Campra trying very hard to write in the Italian style. After our little uh, foray into Europe Galante, we'll end with one very last dance from Couperin in Air de Bacante. Thank you all so much. <laughs> 